Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. The poet Langston Hughes wrote of a dream deferred that festers like a raisin in the sun. What then of justice denied? Might not its absence be even more bitter? The painful stories of the women forced into sexual bondage by the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II are revived in a new report by Amnesty International. The women, whose numbers now dwindle through age and infirmity, are the remnant of 200,000 brutalized victims, whose experience of war was a very personal vision of depravity and degradation. Recognition and justice is due to each of these women. Their suffering is mirrored today in the use of rape as an instrument of war in places like Kosovo, Rwanda, and Darfur. My guest is T. Kumar, Director of Advocacy for Asia with Amnesty International. Kumar, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting us. I'm so glad to have you and so uh, I'm glad that we're talking about this, this topic because, as you know, for many years people didn't talk about it. I, in my opinion, Kumar, it, it was a kind of um, perverse combination of the shame of the victims and the silence, the official silence, of the Japanese government that kept this under wraps. But in 1991, as I understand it, people began to speak out. And now, in 2006, we have this Amnesty International report published, I think, just a couple of months ago. Yeah. Why did the report come out at this time? Why has it become a focus of Amnesty's interest at this time? It's uh, for the last 60 years, uh, justice was not done to these women who were forced into mm -hmm. sexual slavery by a government, mm -hmm. not individuals. Mm -hmm. So we thought it's extremely important that we bring this issue to the forefront and to make sure that in future it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Is that the, the way you use the word future? Is it, uh, I suspected that might be a very important point because we're seeing these kinds of things right now. Yeah, and we need legal uh, restrictions mm -hmm. as well as uh, commitment from governments around the world mm -hmm. that uh, an event like this or similar events like this mm -hmm will not and should not take place. So we are using this as a, uh, for two reasons. Number one, to seek justice to these women. Mm -hmm. Number two is to make sure that no women in future doesn't to go through this experience. Right. And in what you've said, Kumar, it strikes me that the fact that it was a government that did this is especially powerful and important here. Obviously, it was carried out by individuals, but acting at the behest of a government. Yeah, it's a government institute, institution. Mm -hmm as part of their military. Right. It's like a medical uh, team. Mm -hmm. They had this, like uh, food, uh, you know, they have, and they also have women in, in rooms uh, waiting to be served mm -hmm. for the soldiers who come from the battle. I want to talk about that point, the, the sort of graphic description of what actually went on. Because even after all these years, it really doesn't lose its horror when you read about it. I mentioned that there were 200,000 Roughly 200,000 Yeah, we don't know the exact number. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the demands we are urging mm -hmm. Japanese government to come public. It's not about Japan. Mm -hmm. It's not anti-Japan. Mm -hmm. Japanese also have gone through enough pain during the Second World War. We are talking about the nuclear mm -hmm. attack on them. So it's not about them. It so happened you did it. Mm -hmm. So we are urging them to come public. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with the figures and how many women from each country's people were taken. Right. It, throughout Asia it happened. Well, yes, and, and I like your point also that it's not a question of Japan bashing. Mm -hmm. uh, the point, I think, is a general one here about how governments behave mm -hmm. and what they owe to individuals. And I want to talk about individuals in particular. But let's get a scope of this. This uh, depravity lasted from 1932 to 1945. In other words, yes. it was a long period. 13 years. 13 uh, years. 32, 1932, we were able to document that in Shanghai, China, mm -hmm. Japanese uh, were occupying Shanghai at that time. They had uh, comfort women stations. Mm -hmm. But it really took off after 1937. It's, it's, there are some interesting dynamics to it, which I will discuss with you. Mm -hmm. After Japanese uh, captured Nanjing and hundreds of women were raped. Mm -hmm. So this really took off after that. After, after that incident, 
the Japanese military officials and political leaders uh, decided that they have to find a way mm. to one side satisfy them, their troops. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are five reasons they thought they should bring this particular system in reasons place. Reasons such as? Such as number one is to, is to make sure that uh, uh, espionage doesn't take place. Mm. You know, soldiers will be, can be, trapped by, by enemies, uh, by ah, using course, women right, right. to entice them. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason. Mm -hmm. Second is to prevent uh, sexually transmitted diseases from spreading mm -hmm. among the soldiers mm -hmm. so that they will become weak and die. Third is to stop uh, misbehavior. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, misbehavior. That's in their, in their view. In their, by ah. the soldiers in the population. That means stopping. Right rape by the soldiers mm -hmm. in those areas where they control. By sort of control, by allowing them to break so, on so a, they have rape the on a they have, So you have these people here so you, they won't be tempted to go out. Mm -hmm. Number four is to relieve stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you call it, uh, the wartime stress. Number five is the recreation. Mm -hmm. Even to me, when I initially started working on it, I was thinking of the last one, that it's for recreation. Mm -hmm. Then only we found out that uh, it's an institution. Yes. It's, it's an institution that was built victimizing minimum 200,000. It's not only 200, it's much higher. It, well, yeah, probably much higher and, and uh, definitely very largely very young women, very vulnerable women. When you speak of it being institutionalized, I came across a document that was issued, I think, in 1938 in translation, of course, that uh, sort of, uh, it was like a military memorandum about mm -hmm. how these places were to be run. The, the uh, hours, the access, the practice, I mean, it's, it's really very cold-blooded. It's, it's very, very systematic. Uh -huh. And uh, they b brought this particular system as part of the military, you know, regimen, basically. Right. Each regiments have uh, comfort stations. Right. And the age group uh, is um, under 20, mm -hmm. technically under 20, and the youngest we were able to record is 12 years old. When you speak of the youngest you were able to record, in fact, uh, Kumar, I thought, as I read through a lot of the uh, attached documents, that the most anguished part of all of this, even after 60, 70 years, are the testimonies, the of narratives. This. Did you find that to be true? It's so? extremely painful. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, their shame. Mm -hmm. and longing for normal life. Uh, there is one survivor who said, I want to reborn and to have children. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to have grandchildren. When I see grandmas taking their grandchildren, mm -hmm. I long for it, no fault of her, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, she was victimized. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently in Taiwan, uh, local activist groups, human rights groups, organized mock weddings for oh, these really? women, they are in their 70s. Uh -huh. So they were dressed like, you know, like yeah. uh, brides and they were having weddings mm -hmm. to get over that anguish. So the enormous uh, personal pain that this particular group of women underwent, because they were women, by the way. Well, you this know, is gender-based violence. Gender-based violence, and uh, that Taiwanese example you just mentioned is very touching. They would organize these ceremonial mock, mock weddings mock for these weddings. women. We're now very aged. Yeah. Very old. Because another aspect of this, I'm sure you will agree, was the ostracism, uh, the shunning that the in women the would society. face in their own societies after the war. Even own families uh, basically disowned them mm -hmm. because they felt it's a shame on their whole community, on their own families. Mm -hmm. So these women were pretty much left out. Right. And they couldn't be able to speak out, out of shame until 1990s, uh, 91, 92. 91, 92. When uh, one Japanese scholar was able to unearth some documents mm -hmm. that uh, proved without beyond doubt mm -hmm. that uh, it's a government that was be behind it. This is an interesting point and for two reasons. One is that, as you said earlier, this is not Japan bashing and many very honorable Japanese have been uh, appalled by this mm -hmm. for many years. Tell us a bit about the effect of what that particular scholar did in the context of the larger question, why was the Japanese government so silent and so adamantly uh, uh, bent on not acknowledging this for so long? I mean, we have to actually blame uh, other countries and other human rights groups. I mean, we were not around at that time mm -hmm. uh, uh, for partly to be blamed, I will say. Mm -hmm. The reason is after the Second World War, 
We had two war crimes tribunals. Right. Uh, one is uh, Nuremberg in Germany for Germans, mm -hmm. and we have Tokyo trial. Right. The Allied troops knew that this happened, but they did not consider that to be brought into this judicial system at that time. So the punish. allies did not technically bring charges? No, no, no. Mm. So it was kind of so, the, but the Japanese argument was, after the Second World War, all these trials took place, mm -hmm. and there were treaties signed, so everything is a done deal. Mm -hmm. Now why are you bringing it up? Mm -hmm. That's from the international responsibility. We also, we also kept silent. We means human, man, human, human rights organization and other groups uh, all these years. Second is uh, 1990, I mean, they, no government is going to accept that they had this system. That's, uh, so it's an international community mm -hmm. that should have brought it up. Then, of course, until 1990, when the scholar who brought this evidence, then Japanese government was forced to admit, right. yes, it happened. Then only these women, mm -hmm. now they are pretty old, and a lot of people died uh, mm -hmm. out of disease and age. So the handful of women also thought, why don't we say what happened to us? Right. But you know, I, and I'm, this, these are excellent points because uh, we're, we're speaking of the past, and we're speaking of a very painful thing for a, a, a number of surviving women. We're also thinking of the pre speaking of the present and the future. And I think the point you make about the international community having to act is, is very valid then and today. No. One of the reasons the Japanese government said it didn't have to do anything was, as you said, the treaties that it had signed after the war said, no reparations are due, forget it, it's done. Yeah, oh, if anything to do with the Second World War, yeah. it's a done deal. It's a done Everything deal. is finished, we are having a new start. Yeah, but this is the biggest point I thought that you're making in your Amnesty International report, that, and, and correct me if I, mm -hmm. if I didn't get this right. I think what you're saying in the report is, regardless of what any treaty may say, first of all, an individual's right to, to seek justice cannot be denied. That's true. It trumps everything. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, there were you know, mm -hmm. cases filed and it was kind of thrown out, mm -hmm. including in this country. It, that's another point. The yeah. American position has not been particularly helpful. Clear. Now the Congress is taking a lead. Uh, they are passing resolutions, mm -hmm. basically asking for, you know, justice to be done to these women. Mm -hmm. I think, but the, the position, Amnesty and other human rights organizations are advocating, again, correct me if I didn't get it right, is that this right of the individual to seek justice for, for atrocities dates back to the Hague Convention of 1907. It's really rooted in a long-standing yeah, yeah. tradition, and it's that which has to be honored, is that? So? Yes, individual rights uh, uh, to be respected and, and compensation be paid. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, the surviving women mm -hmm. are also asking for an apology. Mm -hmm. Most of the women, I, I'm not sure what percentage, they would be happy for a genuine, sincere apology, mm. more than the monetary compensation. Because it's a humiliation that w these women underwent. No money can uh, compensate that. Right. So if a genuine Japanese government apology, you know, government means mm -hmm. the Congress, it's mm -hmm. called Diet. Mm -hmm. Their apology is saying that we're extremely sorry this happened mm -hmm. and it will never happen again. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Japanese are so adamant uh, in, 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 in doing this human gesture. Right. Especially you have gone through enough hell in the Second World War. Right. You know the pain of right. human beings. Right. So why you are so adamant playing hide and seek mm -hmm. and when you give apology half-hearted, not really meaningful. Let's dwell on this point because I think what you're saying is uh, it's mental solace that these women want. It's the dignity of mm -hmm. an apology more than money, really. Money. And that it's, it, it raises in my mind the question of what, what and this, this is a great human rights question for our time, what is an apology? What, what, is, what are the qualities of an apology? First one I, I'm getting from you is that it has to come from the government. They don't, because there does exist something called the Asian Women's Fund. Yeah, they created they do exist. a fund private organizations in Japan, or hybrid government, mm -hmm. public private. They're on the side. But that's doing. not seen as enough. No, no. It's, uh, we want the Congress, I mean, equivalent to Congress, there it's called Diet, mm -hmm. Parliament to debate the issue mm -hmm. and come clean and say, this, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. We are sorry and please accept our apology. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, apologize or whatever. You say, please accept. Mm -hmm. It's remorsefulness. A sincere remorsefulness that sh that sh that should be needed. You raised the issue just a moment ago, but let's let me press it. 
why is there a reluctance to do that? Or why, why, do you, I mean, why is this, Pride. this is 2006. It's, it's sad. It's truly sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the good Japanese, which is overwhelming majority of the population, mm -hmm. should rise up. It's a fake uh, pride. Mm. Oh, we did it. Why do we have to bow down to these people? Mm. It's fake pride. Mm. Oh, we were the superpower, I mean, mini superpower at one mm -hmm. point. Uh, so it's, they consider it as kind of infringing their, their honor. Mm -hmm. And without realizing they really did so not the women. To, to, put it, to put it, to be very cynical about it for a moment, or very, uh, I apologize for this, but this is the only way I can phrase the question. Do you think there's a sentiment that if, you know, these are very old women, these are 80s, late 80s, 90s, very ill, mm. impoverished, that this, in a matter of a decade or so, will be gone with them? Are people, some people at least, thinking that way? If they think, they are sadly mistaken. Uh -huh. Our campaign is just taking... Uh, uh -huh. uh, the, the, the real move now, uh -huh. you know, grassroots members are working on it mm -hmm. uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. In Japan? In, in Japan as well. We are very strong in Japan. Mm -hmm. So everyone is saying mm -hmm. these women need apology. Even afterwards, we will actually say apologize to the, to the, to the survivors. I mean, mm -hmm. not survivors, descendants. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't play with time. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they would have thought they can play with time, they are cheating themselves. Quite frankly, I like that answer. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like the way you put that because if people think that they can get away with these things, because the world has let them get away with these things. I mean, historically, the pattern has been that particularly women or children or the innocent victims of war pay the biggest price and are qu most quickly forgotten. If women and children are the most affected mm -hmm. in times of war, and the more than 60 to 70 percent of the refugees around the world mm -hmm. and internally displaced mm -hmm. are women, they face the brunt. Mm -hmm. But this is a special type of mm -hmm. abuse that took place, you know, mm -hmm. institutionalized, government-sponsored for a particular reason. Right. You made repeatedly and correctly the point that this is a, we're talking about a moral issue and a worldwide moral issue and one in which a particular country should uh, be honest about its experience and its responsibilities. Um, but I think you've also said that, uh, well, in the Japanese case, that can come through their parliament if the parliament's wise enough to act. But I think you personally have also said an ambassadorial conference of some kind among the various nations involved might be helpful. In other words, is there a diplomatic dimension to this issue in the Japanese context and beyond? I mean, we can, but um, Amnesty USA, what I was trying to do mm -hmm. uh, was trying to bring representatives mm -hmm. from every country here in Washington, like ambassadors mm -hmm. or they are senior officials from each embassy, to hold a public uh, panel discussion or meeting mm -hmm. to talk about this issue. It's not about Japan, as I told you. Mm -hmm. Japanese should be also there. Mm -hmm. And to say, okay, this happened. Past is past. We Please accept our apology. What can we do to Mm -hmm. stop this from happening again? Right. How can we prevent this? Right. That should be the main focus. Mm -hmm. Basically, lessons learned process. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, it's, uh, it's very difficult for political reasons, obviously. But you raise a very important topic and one I wanted to get to right now because, first of all, the apology is central. I, I get the, 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 the point that the, the individual women, we're talking about individuals here. They have names, they have faces, they are people uh, who have to uh, have that satisfaction. Mm -hmm. But I think you're also saying now that more than apologies needed. We need the training of people worldwide to keep these things from happening. We need the punishment of grievous offenders, or maybe still someone who was a policymaker and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and most importantly, it was the word you used right now, some kind of commitment to non-repetition. Yes, and there are certain treaties in place at this mm -hmm. moment to basically Rome statute. Uh, mm -hmm. to, so we will urge these countries mm -hmm to make sure you ratify the Rome Statute, mm -hmm. you know, so, so International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more of a future, forward-looking thing that we would urge. In terms of the future, and, and if the, the, the effort becomes as it is to, to make people ratify the statutes and to do, are there forums where these things, things can be adjudicated? Do we have sufficient? That, that's a good forum. And also then uh, there is uh, something called CEDA, uh, Women's Convention. Mm -hmm. Uh, convention, women, it's, it's violence against women, stopping, mm -hmm. it's a UN convention. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, US did not 
uh, sign or ratify it. Is that part of the International Criminal Court? No, or? it's separate. It's separate. It's an uphill battle. Senate have to ratify it. Right. Uh, so that also we will be urging mm -hmm. the Asian countries. You know, this conference is supposed to be, you know, bringing all the Asian countries where all these women were taken mm -hmm. from Burma eastwards. Almost every country women were taken, including some Dutch women mm -hmm. who were taken from Indonesia. They were, That's you right. know, Dutch was overrun. But the, the Dutch actually punished the Japanese that they, at the end of the war, for those, those instances, didn't they? I mean, not. Uh, really, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, there we have some survivors, Dutch right. survivors who are speaking right. out, saying that this is what happened to them. You know, at the, at the core of this, one of the things that occurred to me as I began to read and think about it, Kumar, and as we talk about it now, is that if you looked at this through a different lens, a slightly different kind of perspective, one could say, very hopefully perhaps, that here is an opportunity for global leadership on a tremendously important question. Because as we both know, you know, Kosovo, Darfur, many other places, this goes on now. Sexual trafficking outside of wars is allied, related to this. In other words, if a country, Japan perhaps, stepped forward and, and really took the lead on these kinds of questions, it might have a powerful Japan, effect. Japan should do it because they give so much money nowadays mm -hmm. for post-conflict reconstruction. Mm -hmm. They're involved in human rights work around, at least in Asia, taking mm -hmm. a leadership. So your moral stand will be enhanced, mm -hmm. or at least not be challenged, mm -hmm. if you try to hide this. You know, you should really come up and come clean mm -hmm. by saying this, is, this has happened, okay, sorry, sincere sorry, mm -hmm. and come out and, and give the facts, mm -hmm. what happened. I mean, it's more of a documentary, basically. Right, and if that were to take place, what do you, what's your sense of the effect it would have on the world community? Oh, two two things will happen. One is, of course, Japan will become much stronger mm -hmm. uh, if that happens. And uh, a strong message to the international community is that you can commit abuses, mm -hmm. but you can't run away. Even after 60 years, here we are going after these guys. Mm -hmm. We will come, human rights community, or the human beings around the world mm -hmm. will not sit quiet you can do an abuse today, mm -hmm. but later on, if you come to know, everyone will be after you. That's the powerful message that every government and community should get, mm -hmm. that time will not, there is no statute or limitation mm -hmm. when it comes to these issues. This will be the powerful example to every one of them. You know, you remind me of the old, uh, Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion, was famous for saying, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what you're telling us. What, what gives you encouragement? I mean, in this particular case, in the larger issue of this kind of thing going on worldwide, and in the even larger uh, subject of human rights, uh, as someone who's been working in this field for a long time and so dedicated to it, are you optimistic about it? About uh, this particular about this issue. particular case and about the world gaining a conscience, maybe that's what I'm yes, thinking of. Yes, I am extremely uh, positive mm -hmm. and confident that uh, this is a beginning. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Congress, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee, despite a lot of opposition from interested parties, mm -hmm. I don't want to go into who the interested parties are. Obviously, it's allied to you, Japanese government mm -hmm. and others who are friends with them, to scuttle it. Uh, the the the. Congress decided, no, we can't be silenced. So they spoke up. This deserves some emphasis. I want my viewers, our viewers, to really understand what we're saying here, because I think it's a very positive message about the American Congress. What precisely did they do? What stance did they, they take? They passed a resolution. It's non-binding resolution. Mm -hmm. When was it passed? Uh, it's about uh, just before the recess, about three weeks ago. Not ah, that recent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. We worked on it. I was there when we worked on this negotiated language eventually to make sure that you know it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, very moving and very touching. It's uh, touching to these women mm. that uh, the world's only superpower, the people who are representing the world's superpower in this term, Congress, is speaking out and caring for you. And that's the message that will be heard loud and clear around the world. I can't tell you how happy I am to hear that 
uh, the Congress of this country took that action. Took that action, mm -hmm. yeah. That, so that does that kind of thing does give you hope. It's it's enormous boost, mm -hmm. and also in other parts of the world, you know, people are really coming and sp getting to know after our report. Mm -hmm. They get to know about this in depth. Everyone heard about it, mm -hmm. but they didn't know the the real findings. What really happened? How did these women take? You know, some women were kidnapped. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some were cheated. Basically saying there is a good job out there, come as nurse. They actually, some women were giving treat, uh, training for nurses to cheat, you know, middlemen. Uh, and they were basically sold to Japanese and they had them as sex slaves trafficked across the country. That's a major trafficking. You know, now we are talking about tra female trafficking. That was the worst form of trafficking. That's right. That's right. And Koreans, North and South Koreans, Japanese, Vietnamese, Singaporeans, Burmese, you name it. You name it, they were Everywhere, involved. Mm -hmm. everywhere, anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. They became part of it. I get from this point that you're making that really, and I, I, would, I can imagine young people hearing this now, that uh, when we were educated to this, we all feel the horror of it. And that's what Amnesty International exists to do, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's what true. human rights organizations are here yes. to do. Uh, you know, imagine a young girl. There were cases which we have documented mm -hmm. going to run an errand. Mm -hmm. And she was kidnapped and become sex slave mm -hmm. uh, for 13 years, and basically 13 years. You know, 50 men at one point, not every woman, they, we have documented at one case in a day, 50 women had four sex uh, with these women, uh, with one woman. Right. And soldiers will be waiting in line mm -hmm. for turns. You know, Kumar, as we conclude our conversation, I just want to say that as horrible as that image is, it's important that we have it in our minds to understand how horrible this practice is. But I want to commend you, Amnesty International, and all the good people of the world who are working to end this kind of thing. Thank you. It's your program that's giving the voice to the voiceless. I mean, thank you very ah. much for, for bringing us and telling this story. You come back many times. Thanks. Thank you. And that is our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. Kumar, thank, thank you, you for talking, man. I, really, I always nice. enjoy talking yeah, to you. Thanks. It makes me.